Hello and welcome to the fourth in the series of videos aimed at developing retro games in vanilla JavaScript using the canvas element. My name is Anthony and please join me in my corner of the web where I like to build stuff in the browser with the latest technologies. As we've now refactored our code and got the foundations in place, we're in a perfect position to push forward and actually start building our Street Fighter game. So the first thing we should look to do is to understand and tackle animation, primarily for our fighters in this video, Ken and Ryu. As you'll soon come to realise, Street Fighter has a lot of data for each fighter, and yes, I do mean a lot. This includes information about their collisions, attacks, head, upper and lower hitboxes, throws, both standard and special moves, and mainly for us today, their animations. This will mean we'll get to work on the full sprite sheet now, rather than just one individual frame. Ultimately, compiling multiple lists of frames for each of the fighters' moves, along with their anchor points. Once we have the basics of the animations implemented, we can then look to implement those animations to the actual moves themselves, which will then further enhance the upcoming videos by adding controls from input devices like keyboards and gamepads. We'll only focus on the forwards and backward moves today, as I think we should understand the basics of animation first. But as we continue in the video series, we'll eventually be adding the attacking and defensive moves too. And finally, if you like what I'm doing here and want to show your support, please why not subscribe, like the video, or give me feedback in the comments section. It will be much appreciated and lets me know if people want to see more of what I'm doing here. And with that, let's jump back into the code. Continuing where we left off in the previous video, we have Ken and Ray's static images bouncing back and forth across the canvas element. But before we can start work on our fighter's animation, We'll first need to return back to the Spriter's resource for our Fighter's Sprite Sheets again. This time, however, we'll save the entire Sprite Sheet rather than stripping it down to one frame. Navigate to Ken and Ryo's Fighter's webpage, and then right-click on each Sprite Sheet image and choose the option to save it. As we no longer need the original images we collected, we can safely overwrite both our original Ken and Ryo files that we have in our Images folder. We do still need to add the transparency colour to each file though before moving forward. So let's load up each sprite sheet into your graphics tool of choice and fix that. I'm using my trusted graphics scale here as an example. Checking back into VS Code, we should now be able to see that we have the complete Ken and Ryu sprite sheets available. Although if we were to look at the result in the browser, it would now look a little strange as we're drawing the entire sprite sheet to the context. Okay, we should probably look to fix this before continuing and learn a bit more about the extending functionality of the canvas's context draw image call. Until now, we've been using the draw image call in its most basic form, taking our image data and drawing it in its entirety to the context. It does, however, offer a couple of overrides that allows us to use sections of the original image and, if necessary, scale that section back to the context. In regards to this video, we'll look to understand the former first, but we will come back to understanding the scaling part a little later when we deal with directions. Opening up our fighter class module, and then into our draw function. Let's see what the draw image call offers. As you can see, we have three definitions available. We're currently using the first option. But if we move down to the third option, you'll notice it now has nine parameters. The first, as before, is a reference to our image data. The next four are a set of dimensions that form the source section of the image that we want to use. The last four are another set of dimensions, but for the destination where you'd like to draw the source section to our context. If we'd want to draw the image as is, in that we do not want to apply any scaling, we'd use the same width and height properties for both the source and destination dimensions. So to fix our current issue, and to get back where we were, we now need to find where our original sprite is located on the sprite sheet, and then pass those dimensions into the draw image call. OK, let's jump back into our graphics tool and draw a selection box around our original frame, on both our Ken and Ryu sprite sheets. This, at least in graphic scale, provides the X and Y positions along with the width and height of the box. We'll take a note of these dimensions and transfer them over to the Ken and Ryu class modules. We'll add a frame property to our fighter classes. First adding an empty array to the fighter class, but then filling in the properties array with the necessary values within our Ken and Ryu classes. The first two properties are the X and Y positions, while the last two are the width and height properties. Moving back to our fighter class, we'll now update the draw image call so that it uses the new arguments. We'll destruct the values out of the frame array and pass them into the function 
Notice how we're using the same width and height values for both the source and destination sections. We'll also need to do the same with our update function as we no longer want to use the image width as it's now far too big for its intended purpose. Instead, we'll again destruct the width value out of the frame array and replace it within the conditional check. Checking back into the browser now should show we're back to where we were, but instead of drawing a whole image to the context, we're now using our sprite sheets to draw only a section of one. This feeds us nicely into animation, but as you can expect, we'll probably need just a few more of these sprite frames to achieve that. As both Ken and Ryu are moving forward and backwards across our canvas at the moment, it makes sense for us to focus on those animations first. So let's have a closer look at those particular frames from our sprite sheets. We can see that both the forward and backward animation has 6 frames. To animate those frames, just like before, we'll need to extract the sections of the image where those frames are located. Let's take Ken's forward animation as an example. Going through each frame, we'll collect each of these sections and place them into an array. Then, to produce the animation, we'll need to iterate through the stored frames with a set interval in between. Ideally, we'd want to have our sprites evenly spaced out across our image, if nothing more to make it easier to extract them. Unfortunately here, we're not that lucky. Instead, we're going to have to manually pull out each frame and hold that data for each fighter. That said, luckily for you, I've already done that prior to this video. Back in our fighter classes, we'll move over to using a map instead of an array to store our frames. Also, as we'll now be working with a collection of frames, let's rename our frame property to the more appropriate name, Frames, instead. As a side note, we could have used an array here, but then we'd have to know the index ID for each frame. This can get a little cumbersome to manage, especially if you start changing the order by inserting or deleting entries. Maps allow us to give each of our frames a unique name identifier, so we no longer need to care about the order. And having this string ID will definitely help us reference each frame by name in the animations that we'll be setting up soon. Starting with our Ken class, we'll now mirror these changes by renaming the frame property to frames, and instantiate the map object. We'll then add the frame details that I prepared earlier for the forward animation. We'll do the same for the Rail class too, with its own set of frame details. Notice I've used a naming convention that groups our frames by name, with a number suffix to hopefully allow us to manage our frames more easily. Also, notice I'm still using arrays for each frame entry. We could have used an object literal here, with individual dimension properties instead. So if you feel more comfortable using those, please go ahead and migrate it over. Although as we move on to more complex animations and a larger frame set, I personally find arrays to be easier to manage. Let's now correct the fighter class so that it uses the map collection instead. I'll first add a new class property called animation frame, which will eventually hold the current frame of our animation. But for now, we'll just use the first entry from our frames object, which is forward dash one. I'll then fix both uses of this object within the update and draw functions by using the maps get function and passing in the animation frame property as the key. Another quick check in the browser and you should notice that our fighters are now using the first frame from the walking forward animation. So the next task is now to iterate through our forward walking frames to complete our first animation for our fighters. In our fighter class we'll change our animation frame property to now be an index value instead, changing it to our starting frame value of 1. Then in our update function we'll increase this property by 1 each frame. As we know, we only have 6 frames of animation for both the forward and the backwards animations. We'll add a condition to ensure we reset the frame index back to 1 when it goes beyond the last frame, causing it to loop. Next, we'll amend our get functions to use the string literal, passing in the animation frame property for the frame index. With another quick check in the browser, it's clear our animation is working, but it's currently way too fast at the moment. We should look to add a delay between each frame to smooth it out somewhat. If you remember from the last video, we discussed that the updates should be based on time. We discovered that an in-game time counter was provided to us automatically through our request animation frame callback function. So, just like the seconds pass value we use for movement, we can use this value for our animation too, but we'll need to use the actual value of time passed overall, rather than the difference between each frame. So let's forward this on to all of our entities update functions that require it, so that it can be used for the animation frame delay. Over in our index.js file, We'll wrap the time variables in a frame time object, renaming our previous time property to previous to remove any repetition. In the time callback, we'll also update the time properties to use the same frame time object 
and lastly we'll replace the first argument in the entity update loop to use the object to instead of the second's past value. And before we forget, let's fix our FPS counter class too, as it uses this variable to update its FPS, changing the update function so that it matches the new frame time object definition. Ok, back in our fighter class, we'll again first correct our update function parameter list, along with the seconds past value we're using for our velocity property. Now that we have the game time available in our entity class, let's create a new property to store a local copy, so that we can compare it to the animation frame delay in our frame update function. We'll call it animation timer and set its default value to zero. Let's next wrap our animation logic with a conditional check to see if the current game time value has surpassed our local animation timer value. We'll add a frame delay of 60 milliseconds, as this seems to work quite well from what I previously tested. So once the game time value has passed our set frame delay, we'll then take the current time and store it in our local animation timer property in preparation for the next animation frame. And, as before, this will increase the local animation frame value. And again, with another browser check, we'll see both Ken and Ryu now smoothly animating as they move back and to across the screen, as you'd expect. Although, we do have two issues that I'd like to tackle. The first being the individual frame's anchor or origin point. At the moment, every frame we've cut from the source sprite sheet has an origin point at the top left hand corner. And as we've cut the frame's location directly from the sprite sheet, corner to corner, the frames will always draw at this point by default, no matter the size of the frame. So even though our animation is playing correctly, the frames are not aligned properly, meaning the animation will therefore not flow correctly, especially if the frame sizes vary widely in size. Let's take Ryo's heavy roundhouse kick animation as another example with this origin point, as the issue might be a little bit more obvious. Notice how the foot Ryu is supposed to be standing on is moving quite erratically. This is due to the fact that the anchor point is located in the top left hand corner. For a one on one fighting game, the origin point is usually at the bottom of the sprite, in the middle of the character's feet. Let's adjust the current origin point to that position and see how it compares. You may notice that we're using a different origin point for each frame of animation. This is required as each frame has a different size, so we need to adjust accordingly to ensure that each frame is aligned. Ok, let's apply the same principle to the walking forward animation and see how it compares to what we currently have. Hopefully you can see how having a proper frame origin point alignment allows the animation to animate more naturally. So back in the code, the first thing I'd like to add is some debugging visuals for our current origin point to make our changes a little bit more obvious. It's generally a good idea to add some form of overlay graphics to assist in providing debugging information about our game code. We'll be using it considerably in the coming videos where we discuss collisions and hitboxes, but to start us off, We'll add it to our origin points. Let's create a new function in our fighter class called draw debug and pass in the context as we'll be using its graphics functions. We'll start by setting its line width to 1 so that it uses a 1 pixel width for its stroke functions. We'll then call the begin path function to start a new stroke path and use the stroke style colour of white. Then using the combination of move to and live to functions we'll create a cross cursor that highlights the position of the origin point using the x and y coordinates. To complete our drawing functions, we'll add the stroke function at the end. We'll call this debug function from the bottom of our draw function, where we can toggle it on and off as required. Let's briefly check to see how this looks in the browser. We can clearly see that we have a white cross drawn at the top left hand corner of our Ken and Ryu entities, presenting our current origin point. Ok, let's go back to our fighter classes and add the correct origin points to our animation frames. Just for ease, rather than typing them out manually, I've also got these prepared, so I'll just paste the correct data into both the Ken and Ryu classes. Same as before, I've just extended the frame entry with another array to house the X and Y positions of the origin point. To make this work as intended, we'll also amend the draw image function within the draw function of the fighter class. But first, we'll again need to destruct the new origin properties from our frame entry. I'm naming them origin X and origin Y here. Then we'll just subtract those values from our position properties for each frame. Just for readability, I formatted the arguments for the draw image function over multiple lines now. Not forgetting, we'll also need to fix the frames destruct call in our update function too. With that, we'll have another look in our browser. Ok, although our walking animation looks perfect now, as we've moved our origin point, we've unfortunately created a couple more issues. Namely, Ken and Ryu seem to be walking in mid-air again. This is because our current Y position for the fighters has always been incorrect, 
and has never really matched the actual floor position of the stage. Ok, let's quickly fix that, but by doing so, I want to start a new concept, using constants. I'm going to create a new folder within the Explorer sidebar, called constants, fully enough, and then create a new JavaScript file called stage.js. This is where we'll store our constant values that relate to our stage entity. In that file, I'll add an exported constant value for our floor's Y position, called stage floor, with a value of 200. This will become useful for the rest of the video series, but for now, we'll import it into our index file and use the constant for our initial Y position for both the Ken and Ryu entities. The next thing I'd like to fix is the fighter's boundaries again. As we've moved the origin point, our constraints no longer work correctly. As the exposition for our origin point is now in the middle of the frame, we'll update both the left and right to conditional checks to use half of the frame's width. And with another check in the browser, everything again looks good, with both Ken and Raya's forward animation being near perfect. Ok, the only issue we really have now is that they both use the forward animation, while moving backwards. Let's correct that next. So the first thing we need to add is the frame data for the backwards frames. Luckily again, I have these to hand, so I'll just copy them over into each of our Ken and Ryo classes, this time with their origin points included. Notice how I've grouped the frames together and put a brief comment above each. This is just to make it easier to read, as we had more frames over the coming videos. To allow us to switch between multiple animations, we need to first create a list of available animations our fighters can choose from, and secondly, a property to store the currently playing animation itself. In our fighter class, I'm going to add two new properties. The first one we'll call state to store the current state of our fighter. We'll explore and talk more about the entity state in the next video, but for now, we'll use it to store our current animation, which is one part of our fighter state anyway. We'll keep it undefined for the moment, while we move on to adding a new empty object property called animations, which strangely enough is there to house the list of available animations for our fighters. Over in our Ken and Ryu classes, We'll now flesh out the animations property. I'm going to add two new properties for our walking forward animation and for the walking backwards animation. Until now, we've been using a string literal along with the frame counter to iterate over the frames using a prefix forward string. To give us a little bit more freedom, we'll list each individual frame out in the object using keys from our frames map object. For the more complex animations we'll be adding later on, this freedom is exactly what we need. So for the walked forwards property, We'll add the necessary keyframes from 1 through to 6, and do the same for the Warp Backwards animation property too, but using the new backwards keys. Once complete, we'll copy it over to the Ryo class too. Even though it's repeated here, honestly, I'm not sure if any of the other fighters have a different walk cycle animation at this point, so we'll leave it like that for the time being. Back in the Fighter class, let's focus on fixing the code so that it works with our new forward animation first. As we now know we have two available animations, Let's set our state property to walk forwards, mirroring the first animation's property from both our Ken and Ryo classes. We'll then fix the frame's get function to pull the frame out of our animation's property based on our current state key, along with the animation frame index. We'll do that both in the update and draw functions. Also, as we're now using an array, we'll now have to set the frame index to start at 0 rather than 1. So we'll just correct our animation frame property and then adjust our frame looping in our animation logic to match the new starting index. Checking the result in the browser. Great, it all looks good. We now have our forward animation working from our animation list, which makes it easy to apply any animation moving forward. So with that, let's look to get our backwards animation implemented. So in our fighter class, we'll next update our movement logic. Let's take the last conditional check and move it to a separate if statement. As this block is checking for the leftmost edge of the screen, we'll set its velocity to 150, but this time we'll also set the state to the walk forwards animation. Likewise, we'll do the same in the previous conditional check, but as this is for the rightmost edge of the screen, we'll set the velocity to minus 150, and the state to the walk backwards animation. And with that, we should be good to go. Let's open the browser again, and voila! We have both Ken and Ryu moving using the correct animations both for the forward and again for the backwards animations. At the moment, both Ken and Ryu are facing right, and ideally, we want the ability to have our fighters facing each other. So the last thing I'd like to add in this video is to allow for our fighters to either face left or right. In regards to achieving this, I've seen many other tutorials just copy all the frames over and mirror them 
having a whole other set of frames in memory just for the opposite direction. This is not required and honestly it's just a waste of memory, as the context has many functions to allow for this internally with little to no performance hit. Let's introduce a new context function called scale here. This function changes the scaling behaviour of all our drawing functions to the context, but for us it will help us perform flipping operations on our entity's frames. It provides two parameters, one for the x-axis and the other for the y-axis, and by default both of these have a value of 1, and they both work on a ratio scale that can be changed independently. As we've learnt previously, all context drawing functions normally operate from the top left to the bottom right. So with both axes having a default scaling factor value of 1, this means each pixel we draw to the context will have a width and height of 1 pixel, and therefore no scaling is applied. Whereas if we were to change both to 0.5, this would halve the pixel dimensions and cause all drawing functions to be halved also. And furthermore, if we use the value of 2, this would double the pixel dimensions and cause all drawing functions to also be doubled. So instead of supplying a positive number, what do you think would happen if we applied a negative number to any of the axes? I assume you already know, but if you said this would cause the image to draw in reverse, then you would be correct. So to help us flip all of our frames from facing right to left, we just need to supply a value of minus 1 on the x-axis. One thing to remember, however, is that the scale function applies to all context functions. So once the default values have been changed, we will need to reset them back before drawing any further images, or the same transformations will be applied. First things first, I'll add another file to our constants folder, and name this fighter.js. This will eventually house any constants relating to our fighters. I'll add a new enum object called fighter direction, and add both a left and right property. As all our fighters face right by default, we'll set the right property to 1, and the left property to minus 1, which in this instance is the opposite direction, matching the same scaling factor as our context scale transformations that I showed previously. In our fighter class, we'll import the fighter direction enum in preparation for later. We'll then change the constructor contract and replace the velocity argument with a new direction property instead. This now means we can instantiate our fighters with a way they'll be facing by default. This also means we don't have an initial velocity value anymore, but as we know we're currently using the warp forward animation by default at the moment, we can just replace it with 150 for now. We'll then add a local direction property to store the value being passed into the constructor. We'll now need to go back to where we created the fighter's object within the index file and correct its arguments. So from there, we'll update the velocity arguments to left for Ken and right for Ryu, using the new fighter direction enum object. Hopefully, VS Code should automatically detect this change and automatically import the reference for us. If not, go ahead and import the constant manually. I'll also update the X positions to a more suitable starter position. Back in the fighter class, we'll apply our new knowledge about the context scale function to our draw function. Adding it directly above the draw image call, we'll make use of our new direction property as the x-axis and use 1 for the y-axis, which we know is the default value. To position the frame correctly with its new scale transformation, we'll also need to multiply the x destination position in the draw image function by the direction property. As mentioned, we'll need to reset the scaling transformations we applied, or they'll continue to affect any following context functions. To do this, we'll use the new context function called setTransform. I won't go into this function here, as it's completely beyond the scope of this tutorial, but in regards to how we're using it for this video, we're just applying the default arguments to the function to reset any applied transformations to the context, which for us is the scaling transform. Next, we'll update the movement logic so that it takes the direction into consideration. We'll explore this a little more in the next video when we start to understand state machines, but for now, we'll just look to add some temporary logic. We'll create a new function called ChangeState, which will return the correct animation name for our fighter. To do this, we'll multiply the velocity value against our direction value. If this is lower than zero, we'll return warp backwards, but if it is, we'll return warp forwards instead. Within our boundary conditional checks, we'll call this new function and then set the return value to the state property. So when a fighter hits the side of the screen, they will change to the correct animation based on their direction and new velocity. We'll also need to set the correct state property for the initial state of our fighter too. So let's reorder the class properties so that we set our direction property first. So that our velocity value can use this to determine the correct velocity speed. We'll then add a call to our new change state function for the state property. And with that we'll have a final check in the browser. Great, 
both Ken and Ray were happily moving back and forth across the screen with the correct animation for their movements, based on their direction, all animating as intended. Ok, let's do a little refactoring before we close today's video. If you remember in our last video, we noticed if we used decimal places within our draw range function, it caused the draw image to apply anti-aliasing to the pixels, making it look blurred. You may also remember that I like my pixels to be chunky and clear, especially for a retro style game like Street Fighter. The fix to this is really quite simple, we just need to ensure any arguments that are passed into the function are rounded up to the nearest whole number. So let's go ahead and wrap all our draw image calls, where we know we'll possibly have decimal values, in a map.floor function. Looking at our entities, this only currently applies to our fighter class, so in the draw function, we'll update all the position arguments with a floor function, first in the draw function and then secondly in the draw debug function. Another thing of note in the draw debug function is how the context performs one pixel stroke functions. Again, due to how it handles decimal values, it would be best to add a 0.5 to each of our line and move calls. Specifically in these calls, this will remove any anti-aliasing. The context also has a special property that applies to image smoothing. To help keep our chunky pixels in any transformations, in the index file, we'll set this property to false to disable this too. The last minor change will also be in our index file, and with our game viewport enum object. As we won't be changing the canvas size any further, it would be best to remove this code, and now just apply the values to our canvas element in the HTML file. So let's move any reference here, and then in the index.html file, add the correct width and height attributes to the canvas element. Just to ensure we've not broken anything, we'll again just double check the result in the browser. No, thankfully, it all looks good. And I think that's a good place to finish the video, honestly. I'll again quickly list what we've learnt today. I had planned for this video to be a little longer, but looking at its current length, I decided to move to the next subject over to the following video, so that might be a little shorter, but I'm saying that and honestly, I really don't know yet, as the topic will be based on applying a state machine for the fighter's basic movements. It'll also look to expand on our current animation knowledge, and set the stage for implementing keyboard and gamepad controls so it could be quite a code heavy session next time. Hopefully people have learnt something about sprite animation from this video, as the principles described here can be applied to any game or programming language. As we're using a large sprite sheet, I thought it would be best for people to understand how to manually pull frames out of it, and how to apply the correct origin points to make that work. The sprite sheets that Sprite's resource supplies are not really optimised for game development, so this knowledge will hopefully come in useful for some people. Again, if you've made it this far, I want to thank you as I really do appreciate you taking the time to watch my content, and especially for the positive feedback I've been receiving so far. My channel has grown somewhat since the last video, so it would seem you like what I do, or at the very least interested in this topic. I'll hopefully be releasing a new video every two weeks moving forwards, potentially adding some smaller content not related to this series along the way. So if you have any thoughts on how I could improve these videos, or the content you'd like to see, why not leave a comment in the comment section? And with that, I'll sign off, and hopefully see you in the next one. Hands out.